the Quran has given a hint. Uh, this hint is what we find in Surah number 15, Surah Al Hijr, verse 87. The Almighty says, Walakad Atainaka Sabam Minal Mafani Wal Quran Al Azim. O Prophet, we have revealed upon you in seven pairs that is the great Quran. So what exactly are seven and what is meant by pairs is what needs to be investigated. Obviously the Quran is stating clearly that that's what the great Quran is comprised of. These passages and these surahs were put together meticulously through an arrangement from the Almighty that were introduced and implemented by Angel Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet sallam himself he, he repeated what he was saying so that the Quran that we have got today is a different book in its arrangement arrangements and I also mentioned uh, the difficulty that a reader confronts when he reads the Quran finds that there are Meccan surahs followed by Madanan surahs followed by Meccan surahs followed by Madanan surahs and it all seems to be not presenting a picture of a book which is particularly well organized the difficulty becomes more significant when we present this book to non-Muslims for them to appreciate it as a book that has come from God. Obviously, within Muslims, there are people who are very critical and uh, they too need to be satisfied. What I'm going to do now is a presentation of the Quran and its arrangement in a manner that I will talk about uh, the path-breaking research done by one scholar of the subcontinent, Maulana Hamiduddin Farahi, who died in the year 1930, who through his sheer brilliance and the Almighty's blessings that he showered upon him, for him to be able to show a way to understand and appreciate the wisdom behind the manner the Quran has been arranged. His research was passed on to his students, one of whom was uh, Maulana Amin Hassan Islahi, who in his uh, book, in his uh, tafsir, exegesis, uh, Tadabur Quran, uh, he explained in detail how the Almighty has, uh, through his supreme wisdom, arranged the Quran in its uh, present uh, form, which really is brilliant, uh, provided one is able to understand and appreciate what exactly are the reasons behind this arrangement. That tafsir exegesis has been further elaborated by Maran Islahi's student, Javed Ahmad Ramdi, and there again we find that this uh, explanation is uh, further elaborated. In uh, a thesis, a PhD thesis written by Dr. Mustansar Mir in the mid late 80s in Michigan University when he wrote uh, his PhD thesis on uh, the exegesis tafsir of Maulana Amin Hassan Islahi Tadabur Quran the title of his thesis was thematic and structural coherence in the Quran so the claim is that the Quran has coherence both in its theme and in its structure the claim is that there are three different levels at which the Quran is coherent. One at the level of uh, surahs, two at the level of surah pairs and three at the level of surah groups. At the level of each surah, the claim is that all surahs, chapters of the Quran, 114, are one entity. Each one of them is a distinct entity. It mentions 
one subject one central idea is what runs through uh, the entire text of the chapter the surah obviously the small surahs can be easily understood following one theme but the larger surahs are a challenge and obviously unless and until you are given proper examples to appreciate this claim there is no reason why you should accept the claim so that's what i'm going to do later so that's one level of coherence the second level of coherence is that the quran has been arranged in a manner the quranic surahs that a vast majority of these surahs actually 108 out of 114 are in pairs such that two surahs coming together they are partners of each other in the sense that they are both serving one broad theme one surah in one way and the other in another there are only six exceptions to this principle six surahs do not form uh, a pair with other surahs and the third claim is that the entire quran is neatly divided into seven groups such that each group begins with one meccan surah or more and ends with one madanan surah or more so the quranic surahs are divided into seven different groups of meccan madanan surahs such that each group has its own basic theme style and focus and all surahs are gradually building up the understanding in their own respective ways to reach the climax but let me now without spending more time on uh, introducing the idea let me give you the examples of the first case that is each quranic surah has its own central idea and all verses they are contributing to that central theme one way or the other when you read quran you open a chapter a surah and you start reading its verses you come across sudden shifts of topics one subject giving way to another all of a sudden and then to a third one without any apparent indication as to why it's happening and so on so let me give you a few examples to help you understand what the problem is and how the problems that i'm going to point out have been sorted out in the second chapter of the quran the longest surah of the quran surah al-baqara verses 34 to 39 are talking about a pretty well known theme story of adam and iblis adam and satan the story is that the almighty asked all angels and it's also implied all jinns to prostrate before adam and it's implied before eve as well all of them prostrated except for iblis he was from amongst the jinn he refused he was arrogant he thought he was superior he said i am made of fire and adam is made of clay dust mud why should i prostrate before him my material my reality my background is better the theme finishes and all of a sudden we find that from verse 40 onwards there are paragraphs after paragraphs which are talking about the same theme the different aspects of the same theme from verse 40 to verse 141 long passage obviously divided into different paragraphs is talking about the invitation that the almighty extended to the children of israel the jews to believe in the quran and the prophet may god bless him on him which we know that the jews didn't do they did not believe in the prophet except for a few people who actually accepted the invitation and sooner or later accepting the reality that uh, the quran is indeed god's word now when you come across this sudden shift 
you're surprised, probably disappointed. But then, when you give it a real thought, genuine deep thought, you realize that, uh, wait a minute, there is something over there. Iblis refused to accept the Almighty's uh, order, expectation to bow down before Adam because he thought himself to be superior. The children of Israel are getting invited to accept Prophet Muhammad, God's mercy be on him, who belonged to the children of Ismail. Now, the children of Ishmael were also the descendants of Abraham, Ibrahim But somehow the children of Israel who had had the occasion, the experience of being the Almighty's representatives before the mankind, Shohada, his representatives, witnesses, for a period of 2000 years when they had prophets after prophets coming to them. And on the other hand, during these 2000 years, the children of Ishmael were living in the Arabian Peninsula without knowledge of books and prophets and the Almighty's different messages that came down during this period. So the children of Israel thought that they were superior. And therefore, if the Almighty is asking them to accept the fact that there is a prophet of God coming to the children of Ismail, there was the same arrogance that was stopping them from accepting this invitation. So the Almighty, before inviting the children of Israel to have faith in the Quran and the prophet who belonged to the children of Ishmael, narrated the story which the Jews already knew of Adam and Iblis to let them know that if they are not going to accept this invitation because they think they are superior to the children of Ishmael, they are actually going to be doing the same thing which Iblis did by not bowing down before Adam. And the children of Israel knew what was the fate of Iblis, how Iblis was uh, condemned by the Almighty for all times to come. So now you understand and you feel good about the fact that verses 34 to 39 have come before verse 40 onwards, verses 40 till 141. The apparent incoherence gives way to a very deep bonding between these two passages coming next to each other and that happens because you think hard and think deep. That's what you find all throughout the Quran. That's what the exciting prospects are there waiting for us to plunge into this ocean of understanding and meanings of the Quran and to discover more and more such arrangements of wisdom that we have in the Quran. I'll give you another example. We find a similar difficulty in Surah Araf, Surah chapter 7, verses 57 and 58, followed by verses 59 onwards. And it's again a very long passage from 59 to 171. Now I'll tell you what does the first passage say. Surah Araf verses 57 and 58 are talking about a familiar oft repeated theme that you find in the Quran, which is Quran says, And it is He, that is God, who sends winds as good news, good tidings. Before his mercy, before the arrival of his mercy. So, what the Quran is saying is that in the atmosphere of the Arabian deserts, the weather is hot, and then all of a sudden you have cool breeze coming down as a good news for the arrival of rainfall, which is to follow. Hatta is a until 
when they have carried heavy rain clouds. Sukhna huli baradil mayyit, we drive them to a dead land. Panzalna bihil ma, and we send down rain. So, clouds come and winds take away these clouds to different lands which are dead, dry, without any plantation. Fanzalna bihil ma, then we send down rain. Fa'akhrajna bihi min kulli thamarat and we bring forth thereby of all the fruits that is fruits, vegetables, crops they emerge as a consequence of rainfall Kazalika likewise we will bring forth the dead so that you may ponder you may be reminded that is the rain comes brings uh, the different possibilities of sustenance of crops and fruits and also brings this understanding that God is fully capable of uh, bringing back life to dead lands likewise he is fully capable of raising the dead back to life when it will come to uh, the occasion when they will be needed to be brought back to life for the purpose of uh, accountability the next verse says, Wal baladut tayyib yakhruju nabatuhu bi izni rabbi. And the good land, that is the fertile land, its vegetation emerges by the permission of its Lord. Wal lazi khabusa, but as for the land which is bad, la yakhruju illa nakeda. Nothing emerges except very ordinary crops, bushes useless stuff likewise we send verses in different forms for those people who are grateful so now the almighty is also explaining that the rain that falls from the sky brings forth crops vegetation etc but there are different lands there are lands that are fertile, responsive and good bumper crop emerges. But there are others which are not fertile and there is nothing that emerges except for ordinary material uh, which is of no use. Okay, that's understandable. But now we move on and what we find is that from verse 59 of chapter 7, till verse 171 the almighty is has shifted as if all of a sudden to a completely different theme which is the messengers of God they come to their respective nations deliver the message some accept the message others reject the message and ultimately the almighty's punishment visits the nation to destroy it. There are six messengers of God whose stories have been mentioned in the Quran over and over again. Why has it been mentioned so repeatedly? I'll talk about it later. But right now, let me mention their names. Nu, Noah, Hud, Saleh, Lut, Lot, Shoaib, Musa, Moses, alayhi salam. May God's mercy be on all of them. All stories narrated either in long passages or relatively short ones. What you find is that it's the same theme that has been mentioned over and over again. Obviously one wonders why on earth is it that when there was a description of uh, clouds, cloud formation, rainfall, crops uh, sprouting from the land. It was mentioned and then all of a sudden there is a new mention completely different from the earlier one that is uh, taking over. Again, obviously it would be a matter of concern for the reader who would think about it and uh, would reflect deeply and hopefully would find the answer by 
relating the two passages and their commonalities. The mention of rainfall in verses 57 and 58 is like the mention of uh, the invitation of the prophets in the subsequent passages. Rainfall is a blessing of God coming from the heavens, from the sky. Material mercy, kindness of the Almighty in the form of uh, water, in the form of plantation. On the other hand, the prophets bring divine revelation and that is also a spiritual rainfall. It also falls on a soil. It's not that physical soil of, uh, of the earth. It's the soil of the souls of humans. And it all depends, like in the case of land, in the case of human land, human soul, it all depends on the quality of soul. If the individual is good, then the spiritual rainfall, uh, that is divine revelation, is going to bring forth crops and fruits in the form of faith, in the form of good conduct. But if the land is useless, the same spiritual rainfall, the same message, the same prophets, the same divine revelation is not going to bring forth anything but negative. So, you know, what happens in the case of rainfall in the physical world is very similar to what happens in the case of the spiritual rainfall in the form of Wahi and that is what has caused the two passages to be put together. As I said, the entire Quran is full of such other examples which if we look at them deeply we'll find that these passages come together because of good reason.